What a day for democracy. Three big cases, three big victories. Welcome to Democracy Docket. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. Mark, it is Thursday, July 11th, 2024. What a day for democracy. Three major victories for voters in court today, starting with the swing state of Wisconsin. Yeah, this is an enormous victory. It is actually the second big victory that we have seen out of the appellate courts of, of Wisconsin in the last few weeks. The first one uh, was uh, a, a few weeks ago where the state Supreme Court restored drop boxes. But today's decision from the Wisconsin Court of Appeals upholds a ruling that deals with what may seem like a very technical issue, but is really, really important, which is what is an address for purposes of uh, someone who votes by, uh, by mail, votes absentee, and has their witness fill out uh, the certification and put in their address? Does that mean you need every little nit and jot? You know, you need the zip code, you need the postal abbreviation, you need the, all of that, or is it just enough information for the, the, the county officials to know or the state or the local officials to know where to find you. And today, the answer is the second. This uh, is a big, big win for voting rights in Wisconsin because at stake are tens of thousands of ballots that the Republicans were trying to have rejected and they failed. And I am proud of my legal team and our client Rise for being in the fr forefront of this lawsuit. Mark, maybe this sounds a little unusual to some people, so let's break it down. In the state of Wisconsin, when you vote absentee, you have to have a witness certify that you completed the ballot and that you are who you say you are. That witness has to fill out their own witness certificate that includes their name and address. And this controversy is not about the address of the voter, but the address of the witness. Why did this become such a big problem in Wisconsin? Well, so it became a big problem in Wisconsin, first of all, because Paige, why do they require a witness, <laughs> right? I mean, like- well, Not it even Texas a big requires a witness to vote absentee. Shh, don't give them any ideas. You know, Greg Abbott could be listening to this. Um, okay, so uh, the fact is that, as we said, Wisconsin requires a witness, which they shouldn't. And they not only require the witness to sign, but they require them to fill out this separate certification with their address. And for a lot of the witnesses, they're thinking, well, I'm married to the person who, or I'm the parent or child of the person who just signed and they filled out their information. So it can't be that I have to fill out the same exact information or they just use abbreviations or they just forget to fill it out. And we're talking about, you know, according to a study after the 2020 election uh, done by the legislature, 7% of all mail-in ballots had some kind of thing with this witness certification. So we're talking about a huge number of ballots. And the Republicans uh, went to court to stop a practice that had been going on to sort of fix this by the local clerks. The local clerks would basically fill in the missing information if they knew it. The, the Republicans went to court and said they can't be filling in this information. The courts agreed. So this litigation was brought, uh, like I said, my law firm brought this case uh, uh, on behalf of our clients to say, okay, well, like, you're right, they, should, they don't have to fill in the information, but if the information that's missing isn't preventing the clerks from knowing where the witness lives, then that's enough information anyway. And that is what the Court of Appeals affirmed today. And this is a big win for democracy. It's a big win for voters on a partisan basis. It's a real loss for Republicans. Republicans have a lot at stake in trying to toss out these mail-in ballots and they failed today. So that's mail and ballots in Wisconsin. Let's head down to Alabama, where we actually got really good news out of a federal court there this morning. Yeah, so Paige, this is a case we've talked a lot about before. This is the Alabama case involving their congressional districts, where uh, a court, uh, my, my law firm brought a lawsuit saying there should be two uh, black opportunity districts in Alabama, not one. We won. It went up to the Supreme Court. Well, that was all on a preliminary, on preliminary relief. Now we're talking about permanent relief. And the state of Alabama argued, like we are seeing state after state after state Republicans argue, that there is no private right of action under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. That is, that private litigants can't enforce Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that only the Department of Justice could. This would kill off Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act as a practical matter. We've talked about this on prior episodes. The links are in the show notes. 
Uh, and and the, the, the court here rejected that argument. The this court here said they are not going to dismiss this case. This case is going to go forward uh, on full merits for the rest of the, uh, the, the decade. And that is a big win not just in Alabama, right? It's a big win, obviously, for black voters in Alabama and for voting rights. But Paige, in this back and forth that we are seeing throughout the country over whether or not this, this, this bad ruling out of Arkansas, the Eighth Circuit, where they said there was no private right of action, we have been watching to see if that's going to spread to the other places. And so far, it hasn't spread. And so today was a big win for voters uh, in uh, Alabama and for voting rights nationwide. If you want to learn more about the fight over private rights of action in voting rights cases nationwide, you can click the link above to watch our video on it or check out the show notes below. The other state I want to talk about today, Mark, is actually Utah and a decision from the state Supreme Court there. Yeah. So, you know, talk about a state that wasn't on a lot of people's bingo cards. Utah congressional redistricting. Don't sleep on it. And you know who didn't sleep on it, Paige? Democracy Docket. Democracy Docket has been covering this Utah case. Make sure you are subscribed uh, to its free daily and weekly uh, newsletters, uh, because if you had been and you are, you would know about this Utah case. Basically, what's happened in Utah is that the people, by popular referendum, approved a ballot measure, Prop 4, uh, to ban partisan gerrymandering and to require the use of an independent redistricting committee. Uh, commission, rather. That was in 2018. So what did the Republicans do, Paige? What do you think the Republicans did? They passed a law to repeal the prop proposition. The legislature, the Republican-controlled legislature was like, yeah, we, that's great that the people think that, but we actually don't want to do that. So they repealed it and drew their own congressional maps. And of course, they then proceeded to partisan gerrymander. Now, people who are not familiar with Utah may think, well, you know, don't Republicans just control the whole state? The fact is that um, if you had uh, Salt Lake City as a within a congressional district, you would probably have a Democratic seat. At minimum, you would have a swing seat. Um, and so the League of Women Voters of Utah, the Mormon Women uh, for Ethical Government and Voters, uh, uh, brought a lawsuit. And the Utah Supreme Court said today that the lower court was wrong for dismissing this case based on that new law, that, that you know, the proposition uh, 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 that required this commission, you know, uh, that, the, that the lower court got this wrong. So the case will go back now to the trial court. I don't want to give people false hope. This is not going to be in effect for 2024. Those maps are locked and loaded in every state. Uh, but this is an important case and an important case to watch for 2026 and beyond uh, as this case continues uh, in the state of Utah. Mark, in addition to these court decisions, two new voting rights cases were filed today, one in Montana, one in Nevada. Let's start in Montana. Yeah. So let's first talk about the good news in, in Montana, right, which is that organizers were able to, to um, uh, after Dobbs, were able to collect sufficient signatures to enshrine abortion rights in the Montana Constitution. Now, Obviously, collecting signatures is only one stage of the process page. But, you know, let's start with the fact of how much energy we have seen in state after state after state, Florida, Arizona, Montana. Um, where else, Paige? Arkansas, Missouri, Ohio. Yeah, this is kind of like a story within a story here that there is so much energy on the on the ground among the grassroots to use these ballot initiatives to to deal with the consequences of the terrible decision that the Supreme Court had in Dobbs, that you are seeing now these cases crop up in all different manner uh, around ballot initiatives, because it really is, in, some, in many instances, the last hope uh, that we have to, uh, uh, to deal with red states' uh, uh, refusal to uh, to, uh, uh, to, to do the right thing uh, around abortion rights. Um, but, you know, as you might imagine, the Republicans in Montana, just like they have in other states, are fighting this tooth and nail. They, uh, the Secretary of State is a Republican, told county officials to reject a whole bunch of signatures uh, from people if they were listed as inactive voters, which is ridiculous because they are obviously qualified electors, even if they are inactive. Um, uh, and so there was a lawsuit filed today, and that is going to proceed forward. And I know a lot about the Montana courts because I've litigated there and won before. And I'll just tell you right now, 
my money is on the people who brought this lawsuit. I think they're going to win this lawsuit. I think they're ultimately going to win this ballot initiative. And, and it's going to be another place where Republicans are going to reap what they sow for having embraced an extreme MAGA agenda on the issue of abortion. Mark, and what's interesting about the Montana situation is that much like Ohio, officials are trying to change the rules once they saw that an abortion measure would maybe be successful. So in Montana, the guidance used to be that you could count signatures from voters who were on the inactive list. But last month in June, Montana Secretary of State Christy Jacobson issued new guidance saying that these signatures shouldn't be counted. And it is very clear that this was done in order to limit the abortion measure. Paige, isn't this just like what they did in Ohio? Yeah, in Ohio, we saw that once a abortion rights measure was likely to make it to the ballot, Ohio Republicans violated their own election law, by the way, in order to order a special election and put a measure on the ballot to change the threshold to approve a constitutional amendment. Now, Ohio Republicans failed spectacularly. The abortion measure ended up passing by a very large margin in Ohio, and I hope the same happens in Montana. Last news update of the day is from the great state of Nevada. Okay, this is a, a, a worrisome development. So it's good news today, and this is a good news story, but but it is premised on a worrying development, which is we are start. We have been warning um, uh, in in these videos, and Democracy Docket has been warning in almost it feels like almost every day. I've written several pieces on the Democracy Docket about this that we are going to face a problem of Republicans refusing to certify act accurate election results, that this was a tactic they rolled out after the 2020 election uh, in Michigan to try to deny Joe Biden the victory in Michigan, literally refusing to sign the paperwork that that totals up the numbers that showed in that instance that Joe Biden had won. And this this assault to subvert elections by refusing to certify act, uh, act, uh, accurate election results is a real threat in 2024 and page something that you all covered uh, in 2022 on Democracy Docket. Right, Democracy Docket has long covered the issues of certification after the election. We really saw it come to a head in 2022 in Cochise County. And the way that one county can mess up the election certification for the entire state and in turn impact the election of officials for the whole country, because it is a domino effect that when one official in one county refuses to certify, it can hold up the swearing in of new members of Congress. Right. And so that's what, what we're facing for 2024. And we are seeing it start to play out on the local level in Nevada, where um, the Washoe County Commission, and by the way, Washoe County is the second largest county in the state. This is not a small county. This is the county that contains Reno, Nevada, uh, Clark County with Las Vegas obviously being the largest. This is the second largest county. It is a traditional swing county that has increasingly become Democratic. But the uh, county commission, which remains 3-2 Republican, uh, the, it voted on that basis 3-2 against certifying the election results of recounts in two races uh, from the state's June uh, 9th primary. Uh, one was for a seat on the Washoe County Board of Commissioners, the other for the Washoe County uh, School Board of uh, Board Trustee. Now, if they're going to hold up certification for recounts for local elections, as important as they are, we can just imagine what they are going to do if Nevada is razor thin as it has been before and they don't like the results. So kudos to uh, and the hero of the day goes to uh, Attorney General Aaron Ford. Uh, who is the Attorney General of Nevada? Attorney General of Nevada. I have praised him before. Uh, he brought a lawsuit uh, on his behalf and on behalf of the Secretary of State, saying this is not acceptable. Filed it directly in the state Supreme Court. It was reported. I might even say first reported page on Democracy Docket, and I know they are tracking it. And so everyone needs to pay attention to that, both because of the impacts it has in this instance, but what it speaks to that we are going to face as we head towards 2024. Thank you all for joining this special good news edition of uh, Democracy Docket. Please make sure you are subscribed to our free daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time.